Shaka, it took every second to get to the Sweet 16. How sweet is this trip? <laughs> Man, so grateful for our guys just hanging in there. There were so many moments where we could have cracked, been through a lot of adversity this year. Getting this guy back right on time was perfect for us. He led the way, and his belief and toughness really transferred over to our other guys. You've been very emotional through this. You just raised your arms, pointed to the crowd. What emotions are you feeling right now? It's, it's gratitude. Gratitude for these guys, our fans, our guys hanging in there, continuing to fight, and now we get to keep playing. Where's that emotion coming from? Love, man. I love these guys. Um, I don't want the season to end. That's the biggest thing, you know. So now we get several more days, get to go home, rest up, go down to Dallas. Let me bring in Tyler. Congrats. Tyler, you've been through a lot. You told me when you lost to Michigan State, you've been thinking about this moment for over a year. How'd you get here? Yeah, I told him in the huddle, I get the last word every time before we go back to the bench. I told him it's been in our, this is what's been in our nightmares. We just got to go after and attack it. We're not running from our nightmares anymore. What were those nightmares like? I mean, playing with my guys, it doesn't beat it. In March and, you know, last year the season got cut short. We didn't do what we wanted to do in the tournament, but, you know, now it's survive in advance. Game was on the line. You made the bucket. At what point in that moment did you say, I have to make this happen? Go! <laughs> now, the whole game, I just take what they give me, man. I mean, they were giving me, they were giving me assists, they are giving me buckets. It really doesn't matter. I mean, I was just trying to take what they give me and do what we need to do to win. Congratulations. We'll see you in the Sweet 16. Appreciate it. Thank so it's going to be a Sweet 16 in Dallas Friday between NC State and Marquette. If we just focus on what Chaka Smart's been able to do now in year three with the Golden Eagles, it's the program's first Sweet 16 since 2013. It's Shaka Smart's first Sweet 16 since 2011, which was a great year for him at BCU. Of course, Texas was in between, but it looks like he's found his home out there with Marquette. Hey there, folks. It is a final and Marquette moving on. I'm Tommy Tran, Emily Proud, and Michael Donald joining us here to break this game down. And let's start with the late game situations. We were all watching it together. What stood out to you or what questions do you have about how that thing ended? Am I allowed to use the word <laughs> flabbergasted? Sure, I, I don't know yeah. what the okay. pace was that K.J. Simpson was, was, was running at. He had seven seconds left. You're down by four, two possessions. You got to get it across. At that point, it doesn't matter three or two. You got to take the best available shot, but you also have to take a quick shot to get yourself in an opportunity to foul and then have another chance to go down the court. I don't understand his casualness. It was very strange. I kind of feel like John Travolta and Pulp Fiction, like walking around the house, like, what, what are we doing here? Uh, just a bizarre kind of end of game sequence. Not the first time we've seen it, though, in this tournament. You saw it with Jonel Davis. Yeah, yeah, that very with strange. Florida Atlantic, is this just a product of the NCAA tournament and the magnitude is. It's hard in that, in that circumstance? I don't know how you cannot know exactly. I mean, they were coming out of a timeout. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how you don't know exactly what you're supposed to do. It's, they had the play run. It was a ball screen on the right side of the floor. Whether they switched or didn't switch, you've got K.J. Simpson, who had a great game. He had 20 points. He was fantastic, and he's been great all season. It was just the casualness of him dribbling up the court as if there were two minutes on the clock. Bizarre. I, I honestly don't understand it. The double-digit halftime lead is something I referenced here. And then in the second half, Colorado made it interesting. How did they get back into the game? Well, when we talked at halftime, we said that there needs to be a much more grittier effort defensively. And they started to get consecutive stops. And in, in, in the game of basketball, you're always looking for kills. A kill in basketball is three stops in a row. That counts as one kill. And Colorado started to get... Uh, uh, two, three, four kills in a row to where uh, Marquette got out of sync. They couldn't find shots. They couldn't get open threes. They couldn't get looks at the rim. And all of a sudden, those kills added up. And then Colorado said, okay, confidence. Three started falling. It's amazing what happens when you commit yourself defensively when the shots start falling. Because we were watching the game. Colorado was cold in the first half. Nothing would go down. They made a great adjustment defensively. They changed the way that they were covering the pick-and-roll action of Marquette. 
but they couldn't really withstand that throughout the course of the entire second half, and Marquette made the adjustment. They spaced out more, and they used Kolick a lot more as a scorer. Now, the way that uh, Colorado was playing Marquette defensively was they were treating Kolick as a passer, and Kolick ends up dropping 21 points, and he has 11 assists. He was, I mean, masterful, maestro, all the M words, just fantastic in this game. 22 total assists in this tournament since coming back from an injury. What does he do to make things easier when he's not the one scoring, which he did quite a bit today, but what does he do to make it easier for the guys around him? So there are layers to his game. And the first thing about Kolick is what he didn't have two years ago is he's a capable three-point shooter. So in years past, you know, defenders would, well, let's, were daring you to shoot the three. Can't do that anymore. He's not looking to shoot a lot of threes, but he's dangerous enough to where you can't just leave him open. That's number one. Number two is he's never sped up. He's always under control. The ball, as we like to say, the ball's on a string, and he's never, it's never uh, um, unorthodox. It's never out of sync. He's never dribbling the ball off his foot. He always has a great handle, and he just is one of those guys we can, we can look and marvel at, like, look what he does analytically. He just sees the game better than anybody else in the country. He's not, he doesn't, he's such a great passer. He doesn't care about who's guarding him initially. He's watching the third line of defense. He's watching three defenders in front of him of what is actually happening. And, you know, we could talk about how do you get to that point? Sometimes you're just born with it, and that is Tyler Kolick. But you don't make those passes if you can't shoot a little bit from the perimeter. That Marquette offense does not work. Just to button up on Kolick, because of that oblique injury, I think people were predicting, prognosticating what percentage he was against Western Kentucky, which they found that deficit early, and maybe it just took a little bit for them to get things going again, which they did in the second half and early in the first half in this game. Moving forward, they've got a date with NC State and Dallas on Friday. What's the, the tactical view that you have with these two teams? You know, it's going to be interesting to see how Marquette guards the big fella Burns down low. Marquette doesn't have that kind of just one-on-one -on -one size, but they do have the depth. They've got more depth than NC State does, so you're throwing bodies at him. The thing about Marquette, though, is when you look at Kolick, the point guard, and you got uh, Ogadaro, who, you know, he's great at, at, at post-defense and understanding how to front and when to go three-quarter court, and that's a little inside basketball talk, but Marquette's wings are excellent rebounders, right? You don't compete with UConn consistently if you can't rebound the basketball, right? They only lost to Purdue by four. You're gonna get blown out by Purdue if you don't rebound the basketball. Marquette can rebound, their wings are big. They don't have this huge center, but collectively they're a bigger team. It's gonna be, you know, double teaming Burns is the only way to stop Burns and you have to, and you're in scramble mode because NC State can shoot threes. Doubling and triple teaming Burns is going to be something that we're going to see uh, from Marquette, really, you know, in a couple of days. It's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, there's very few people who can match up with DJ Burns. They don't Maybe just Zach Eadie? Is, that, is yeah. that just that it? That might be the only guy. Yeah. 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 So if Marquette doesn't have that guy, conversely, what problems can the Golden Eagles cause NC State? Well, because Burns is big, and, and his big knock in the last couple of years of why he hasn't been dominant has been his conditioning, is that he couldn't go for more than, you know, two minutes at a time. A two hard minutes up and down the floor, Burns needs a break. You set him for three or four minutes and you put him back in. Well, Marquette can go fast, consistently, all the time. So getting him out and running in transition, that you want to make him work on defense as much as you can and put him in ball screens. Mike, certainly appreciate it. Breaking it out at halftime and post game of this Colorado and Marquette game. We are here with you throughout the day. Make sure to catch the Ion College Basketball Podcast. Guys, you know what's interesting? The Big East only got three bids in, but Connecticut is a 13 and a half point favorite. And David Gay through top heavy Big East in the NCAA tournament through two rounds so far.